Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for the invitation. I was a bit surprised to get invited to talk about data. It's sort of not very normal, especially because I don't consider myself very much of a data person, as you will see in my talk. But I, I will do my best to talk about data and what I think are some data needs or data approaches in order to begin managing fisheries for stewardship and for continuous innovation. That's a bit of a change. Um, I will ground this uh, talking about fisheries. This is the type of fisheries I'll be talking about. So I won't be talking about, I'll be talking about coastal fisheries, small boats, mainly dive fisheries operate two, three miles off the coast. Okay, so for the talk today, most of it anyway, you can forget about your hake fisheries, your big oceanic fisheries, etc. Okay, this is what I'm going to focus on. I decided to start with this slide. This is welcome to the Anthropocene, this planet dominated by humans that actually made it to the economist. And then this Anthropocene, I think, sort of synthesizes a little bit my view about data needs. In the Anthropocene, humans are more than just drivers of ecosystem change. They're also part of a social system that interacts with the environment. And in this sense, what I'm going to do today is give you a few examples that I think are relevant regarding data. Data for what? Data to understand social determinants and responses to natural resource management. Ideally, the types of data we might need to inform the, the design of innovative resource management. As I said, I'm going to ground these data uses in uh, the management of artisanal fisheries and the management of artisanal fisheries in Chile. You're going to have to bear with me two or three slides because I'm going to have to introduce the system I'll be talking about so we all sort of know what we're talking about together. This is the small scale benthic fisheries system in Chile. It operates through hookah diving. There's a round of, now there must be about 25 or 20, 25,000 hookah divers in Chile. Operates, as I was telling you, in coastal zones, mainly through uh, hookah diving, lands around 350,000 tons a year of benthic resources. The fishery operates from different fishing coves, cofradillas, we call those caletas. Okay, this is just a picture of one of these, so you get an image of, of how the fishery is organized. There's around 450 of these fishing coves in Chile. This benthic fishery targets 40 different species. One of these 40 different species is this one. It's a gastropod. We call it a loco. Okay, it's mainly exported. This one must measure about 11 centimeters, the minimum size is 10 centimeters, and this one must be worth around 1.2 dollars each. Okay, so you get like a sense of the value of this fishery. This gastropod is important because of its price, it's been important because of its landings, and it's also important because of the history of its management for what we're going to talk about today about data. Okay, the exploitation of this resource led to a series of historical developments that I'm not going to talk about today, but that changed the governance of these benthic fisheries. Okay, so historically it had been a, I call it a de facto open access fishery. There was some type of fishery registry, etc., but was like a de facto open access fishery. And in order to manage mainly this species, after 1989, it was a governance transformation to more of a rights-based approach to managing benthic fisheries, okay, or territorial user rights. The way this policy was formed is this one. We call it the management area policy, but in essence what it grants, it grants territorial user rights. This was implemented in 1991 to uh, organized associations of artisanal fishermen, okay. So these are not individual rights. These are territorial user rights, so it's not private property, and they're giving to the association, to the organization, not to individuals. Why this resource has been said to be overexploited, etc., and they wanted to be, um, they wanted to create a sense of ownership, which could generate incentives for sustainable extraction. A little bit to stop this 
tragedy of the commons that Hardin calls. I sort of call it the tragedy of the open access. So let's leave it there. This implies fishers must actively look after an area to prevent poaching. This is just an example of a turf. They ban the extraction of other species here. They have to pay for the management plans. So there's an initial management plan that sets a total allowable catch and a five-year management strategy that is paid to biological consultants by the fishermen. And then that management plan is approved and has a yearly follow-up. That's sort of the way it works. Today in Chile, we have around 750 of these turfs. So if this is a map of Chile, these little lines represent the turfs. Of course, there's not 750 lines here, but it sort of represents there are along the whole coast of Chile. Out of these 750, around 400 are active. Okay, some have been abandoned, some were never really granted. So just so you get an impression, there's around 400 active turfs managed, co-managed by artisanal fishermen. If we sum these 400 little lines, it's more than a thousand square kilometers that is being co-managed in hands of different groups of artisanal fishermen. Okay, that's, that's the way the system works. And there's around 30,000, 35,000 small scale fishers engaged in this activity. This is maybe half of the whole artisanal uh, workforce we have in the country. Turf management has uh, generally been based on data. And for every one of these little black lines, for every one of these turfs, um, the management plan ye has yearly estimates of abundance, capture per unit efforts, size, etc. Initial studies showed how these same variables increased within turfs in comparison to open access areas that were in other places. Okay, so that's sort of what has been led and what started the process of this policy. Recently, we published a few papers that for me were quite surprising because it was, yeah, we know all this to manage benthic resources, but these fishermen are looking after these areas. So I said, okay, maybe these areas could benefit wider conservation of the ecosystem. We sort of proved that. I, I don't have time to go into this, but this is just like the richness, overall number of species in open access areas, in turfs, and in a benchmark no-take MPA. This no-take MPA is probably the only no-take MPA that is enforced in Chile. Okay, so the other 21, I don't know, probably would look like this, just so you know. So they're not, these turfs are not an MPA, but um, they, they do conserve more species richness. Huh? I can show you, I can send you the stuff about um, uh, abundance, biomass, etc. But this is richness, hardest variable to respond. This is just a multivariate analysis. Color codes are the same. These uh, red dots are the no-take MPA. These red triangles are the well-enforced turfs. These others are badly enforced turfs and open access areas. So you sort of see that community structure is also there. What's pretty interesting, though, is that it's different not only for benthic resources. Remember, this policy was created in 1991, implemented in 1997 for benthic resources. But we see important conservation of reef fish. This is just one example, real pictures. This is uh, Vilagai, one of these species, in open access areas around two by 400 square meters, in a well-managed turf is around 22, okay? just to give you like an impression. The policy was not designed for this. Just want to keep that very clear. The policy was designed to manage fisheries, and mainly one fishery, this gastropod fishery. Now it's been used to manage quite a few benthic fisheries, no reef fish, etc. Okay, so this is the setting. This is like the system I'll be talking about, so we can understand a little bit about what data requirements we might need. So what types of data? To understand fishers' responses and determinants of turf outcomes. It's just understanding capture per unit effort, income, calculating tax enough. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do four things. First, I'm gonna I'm gonna start from the very simple. That's just what types of data we need to describe benefits and problems and achievements that have to do with these fisheries, mainly using perceptions. Then I want to talk a little about, about data types to assess changes in social system variables. 
Then about understanding the determinants of turf outcomes, and I'll talk a little bit about social network analysis and the types of data that can contribute. Then I'll talk about data to understand if fishermen are actually internalizing these norms about complying with total allowable catches, etc. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some game theory stuff we're doing with fishermen. And then ideally, once I do that, towards the end of my talk, I'll try to synthesize some of these things and say, yeah, how come these types of data actually contribute to enable innovation in the turf system? How can this actually, why are these data possibly important? Okay, so that's what I'm gonna do for the next, well, 30 minutes or so. So I'm just starting with the most simple, this is data on Fisher's main problems and benefits. And although it's simple, sometimes it's super interesting data that we don't gather. Nobody's been gathering this data in time, and I'm sort of surprised. 25 years of a system, it would have been super easy just going there, do these free illicit questions, asking people to define their problems, the main benefits, etc., to define the issues in their own terms, enabling spontaneous responses. So what's your main problem? What's your main benefit? What happens when we do this? We've done this with more than 500 fishermen, 55 associations along the whole country, a randomized sort of um, sampling. I won't get into detail, but within these organizations, there, there's quite a, little, a lot of heterogeneity. So you have uh, organizations with, what, 20 fishermen, others with 280. The size of the turfs can go from six hectares to 986 hectares very big turfs, very small turfs, okay? The average in Chile is around 100 hectares, just so you know. The income from the turf, pretty important. That can come from less than 1% to 90% of your income. So people who just have it a little bit as a savings account, there are people who really depend on the resources of the turf for all their livelihoods, etc. Irrespective of this, the, this, these are the main problems I've categorized, etc. As you can see, there's not many differences along the different regions of Chile. These are the main benefits, the main problems. 72% of fishermen, oh, that's my great data point for this talk, no? 72% of fishermen, theft, main problem. 8% conflict, mainly due to theft. In terms of benefits, the main benefits that these fishermen have or perceive, remember, these are open-ended questions. I hear nobody said anything. First thing they say is, oh, you know, these are like ecological benefits with our resources. So something must be working anyway. And 22% talk about how their organization, thanks to the turf and the work of the turf, has been consolidated in time. Okay, so super easy data. I just go out there, ask two questions, open-ended questions. It's funny how these super in, uh, simple questions though, uh, are used by policy. So thanks to these Look, there's 72% of this sample, etc. The government has thought of a new proposal in the law to strengthen sanctions. Until last year, stealing loco was less than stealing a chicken. Okay, from next year, it's gonna be like stealing a television. Okay, so, just, so you see this super simple data. We can get a little bit more structured data. So what happens if we actually ask someone to rank stuff, etc.? So how well have turf objectives been achieved? We did this the same with loads of fishermen along the coast of Chile. And this is just to show you, five is totally achieved, one is not achieved. So in terms of economic benefits, on average, turfs seem not to be achieving the expected objective. In terms of tourism, even less. But in terms of these other variables, ecological variables, some variables that the government really didn't even think about. Behavioral variables in terms of compliance, et cetera. And this one, that's the one that's been mostly achieved, that's the territorial variables. Having some, I would like to call it, territorial empowerment. A place, a place to negotiate, a place where you can actually fight for your rights, et cetera, okay? So this starts teaching you a little bit more. So when we want TNC, now wants indicators of turfs, 25 years late, but at least we're gonna get them, indicators of turfs. So we say, oh, maybe we need multiple dimensions of success. Yeah, maybe some of these aren't economically profitable, but if only 5% of your income depends on it, maybe it's good enough if you're getting your territorial empowerment. 
There's a reason why these people, they can give them back. Huh? Fishermen can give back their turfs. They're not doing it. Okay, so back to the data. This is where things start getting, at least for me, a little bit more challenging. It has to do with, yeah, how, how, what types of data do we need to start assessing changes in social systems? And here I'm going to start with personal changes, changes in, in attitudes, okay? And all these more participatory natural resource management, conservation, you name it. TERFs, for instance, these policies are dependent on the actions and participation of people. In this case, fishermen. You're granting them rights, co-management rights. Therefore, to assure environmental protection, these measures should generate changes in environmental attitudes of the actors involved. This is a fight I used to have a lot with environmental NGOs. I would say, yeah, of course, Stefan, your fishermen are managing this, but under the first crisis, who says they're not just going to thrash all the turf? I say, oh, let's start somewhere. What's the starting point? Well, let's see if environmental attitudes have changed while co-managing these resources. Okay, so that's what we did. So do environmental attitudes change while managing resources in a turf regime? Simple answer, fast data, yes. We did this, got together with the psychologists, etc. We assessed fishermen's environmental attitudes and we sort of measured how they could change favorably with the time involved with the turf system. I'm going to just take a minute here because this is not a psychology department, but what is an environmental attitude? Okay, so psychologists define attitudinal domains that you have to actually measure and prove, etc. It's not just random questions around, okay? So we did all this work and we sort of discovered that when fishermen talk about environmental issues, one environmental domain could be water pollution, okay? So pollution issues, etc., is one domain of the environment. That is totally different to when they're talking about charismatic species and sea lions totally different environmental domain. Different, I'm going to go down here, I'll leave that one for the end, to when they're talking about stock conservation, resource stock conservation. Well, they're different environmental domains. And different to this one, that's the hardest one to, to identify, that what we call the conservation profit domain, that sort of discount rates, etc. Okay, so how much conservation today for profit tomorrow? Th that type of questions. Okay, so we did all the stuff psychologists have to do. It's pretty interesting develop these scales, have this reliability index. For psychologists, if this is above 0 0.70, 0 0.75, the scale is a valid scale, et cetera. So we sort of complied with everything. And then we sort of assessed how these attitudes changed in time. These two, the water pollution environmental domain and the conservation profit environmental domain, were the ones that changed favorably with the time involved in the turf policy. Okay, just so you know. Why didn't the stock conservation domain really change? Because it was always high. Okay, so it really didn't change with time, just so you know. And this one was pretty cool, the charismatic species domain, because their uh, divers had more favorable, or sorry, less fa more favorable attitudes towards, let's say, charismatic species such as sea lions, as the ones we were doing here, versus net fishermen that really hated the sea lions. And we could sort of see that. I'm not going to show you all the data, but you can read about it. And, and, and you can see how there's a positive regression analysis between livelihood styles and this domain. So these two that are the ones that I'm interested in now, these are just hypotheses. But why could these environmental attitudes shift with time? What can we start learning about these types of data? The water pollution domain? Well, no. we know resources are sold in international markets. I told you that. This is a hypothesis, but I think fishers have become to understand the needs of these export markets. That has raised awareness of the need of water quality and reduced pollution. So it makes sense. Hypothesis makes sense from the data. What about the conservation profit trade-offs? We know these resources are harvested through diving. Diving is a very visual activity. Okay. Well, I think as these fishermen have experienced a correlation between diversity, density, and management. I showed you those data on diversity within turfs versus without turfs. I didn't bring this data here, but we've also taken recreational divers, non-biologists, to dive in turfs, outside turfs, and done a whole study on this, but they are able to recognize differences 
when diving within an outside attempt. So fishermen as well. What I think is that this has made them more aware of the impacts of their actions, be them positive or negative, on ecosystems while trying to make a profit. So here I'm not saying that suddenly these fishermen became conservationists. I'm just saying they're more aware of their actions. So they know if they manage this in this way, the system looks like this. And it's actually better. If they can't manage it in that way, it looks this other way. So that has helped shift their environmental attitudes uh, regarding this domain. Is this important? I think it's super important because there's some evidence, and there's not that many out there, that greater stakeholder participation, I use the word may here, means, but may be linked with greater concern for their environment, at least in terms of attitudes. You know, there's a relationship between your attitudes and your behavior. Okay. So there's something called the theory of reasoned action. So it sort of says that your behavior depends of social, your social surroundings, the social norms, your attitudes. And there's loads of meta-analysis between attitudes and behavior. And there's like a regression coefficient of like 0, 40 something. That for social science is pretty okay. -ish. Okay. So that's that's how sure we are of this. But just, just to give you like the full picture, but we see changes in attitudes. I think this is important because it starts telling us we have to be aware of not prematurely judging early stage turf partnerships. When we say early stage, well, 10 years, 15 years, it's quite early stage. These are radical changes in management. These are fishermen who used to work in an open access system, migrating along the coast, and suddenly now they have to work within a turf, within a region, power relations change, etc. I think this also starts giving us some hope that turfs could generate a social setting for further innovation. This is just an example I brought, uh, and this is one, it's a fisherman protest uh, against uh, uh, pollution. But there has been important empowerment here. There's a lot of thermoelectric plants in the north of Chile. And this has been one of the nicest things I've ever seen. So I was in this meeting. And then fishermen were protesting because of the thermoelectric plant. And thermoelectric plants need water to cool down. That, that's why they use the seawater. So fishermen were there. And after all this, so they started arguing and said, yes, but I need you, the, the, the business, not me, to calculate how many larvae we're going to lose in this water. That's pretty cool. So there's been this process of empowerment as well through having these rights. So that's one type of de data. What's another type of data? This, I'm just going to use an example on maybe social, on, on trying to understand some determinants for turf outcomes. And we use social network analysis. So what's a bit of background on this? People and organizations interact and form networks. These can facilitate or hinder resource and information flows which are relevant for human action. Social capital, in terms of network theory, represents the stocks of relationships from the perspective of actors of a network. So the, these lines sort of could represent this social capital. What does the social capital hypothesis say in terms of networks? It establishes that investment in social relationships by an actor can generate gains in other forms of capital, increasing capacities. Okay, so this is all about stocks. So in this hypothesis that has to do with what can determine turf outcomes, what we, this is just a hypothesis, but higher social capital, more relationships, etc., could be associated to better performance of turfs from an ecological economic perspective. So we went there, we measured these. It's not so hard to measure. This is in fact, the turf governance network based on facilitating degree. So how much do these relationships facilitate your management of the turf? Okay, so this is the network for two regions of Chile. These circles are the fishermen associations. The size of the symbols is the number of connections. And I have painted these other type of organizations in different colors. So the blues are, have like a high facilitation. The, med the, um, the greens are medium, the yellows are low, and the reds are negative. So when, I, when I give this talk, NGOs don't like me very much because it's a little bit red dot here. Okay. University likes me quite a lot because it's a big blue 
square over there. Say, so that's sort of this thing. What we're really interested in, though, are the lines, are the connections. So if social capital, if your connections actually influence your uh, outcomes of management. This is pretty hard when you just see a network like this. So what we did is we sort of established some typology, some types of social capital. We developed a social capital index, so data. We developed a linking social capital index and a bridging social capital index. What does this mean? Linking social capital are the relationships between organizations and other levels, so these type of lines. And the bridging are the bridges with, between uh, fishermen organizations. Following me? We developed this, this, this index. And we developed a small typology so we could see that there were organizations that high, had high linking social capital and high bridging, high and low bridging, low linking, high bridging, low and low, etc. Then we related this to different dimensions of performance, ecological performance and economic performance. In general, and you can see this uh, pretty easily, linking social capital is generally more present and higher values. So these relationships. Of course, we need both. We start thinking about some things that actually don't work thanks to this. We've tried Corfo, that's the, the, like the, one of the fishery sort of agency support systems, has tried for, what, 10 years, let's say, to get these people to these organizations to sell collectively. And they failed time after time after time. And of course, when there's no bridging social capital, what the policy has done has been a very good policy in generating linking relationships. So the relationships between the organization and the consultant, the organization and the money, the organization and the under fisheries, uh, and the under fisheries. That's been really good. And you can see that here. And that's positive. Because those relationships actually are related to the ecological performance of these, of these turfs. The problem is that we also need these other relationships. We haven't even established a set of policies to try to build bridging social capital, at least in Chile. You start seeing the consequences, and we try after try. Well, it might be a lot easier to start investing in, these, in other types of things that can uh, build bridging social capital. because. Both bridging and linking social capital relate to the economic performance of the turfs. We've written this a, a few times, so if someone's interested, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to give you all this stuff at the end. We've talked about bridging and linking relationships. Well, that's different types of data. What about bonding relationships? Bonding relationships are the relationships within the organization. And this is where things that maybe you've heard about more happen. Leadership is part of a bonding relationship. OK, so what we did here was assess the performance of different turfs. These are just different uh, unions that have turfs. And we tried to look at how network structure, the position of the leader, different variables of leader, and other variables sort of uh, how network structure relate to sanctions, etc., and how this can explain outcomes. It's not very simple. A lot of the literature says, no, oh, these bonding relationships are associated to good performance. You know what? Once you start measuring these things, things are not so deterministic at all. So what we're trying to do now is begin unpacking these pro-social elements that are confounded within these networks of social capital. So you want data, well, there you've got data to send to the moon. OK, you can have the indexes you want. This has to do with performance. Well, we have to understand these are the leaders. These are networks on communication. What happens with nations of so social support? How are these interconnected between themselves? And this is the only way we're going to start understanding some of these processes. Number four. And this has to do with norm internalization by these fishermen of some of the rules of the turfs. And here we sort of assumed a bit of a challenge. We started doing experiments. What type of experiments? More experimental economic experiments. In general, a lot of what we know about management of common pool resources, human behavior, comes from experiments, more than what you think. 
The problem is that these experiments are mainly done with students from Harvard, Princeton, and Stanford that are quite far from managing local. Okay, but those are because these are the professors. And what's accessible to the professors? The students. So now human behavior, what we know is structured by, <laughs> by students. I find that ridiculous. So what we did is, did these experiments with fishermen. It's not easy, huh? We had to develop new types of keyboards. We wanted to do this with payment functions, etc. So we tried to do these experiments in which we identify factors which can promote cooperation by isolating other factors as an experiment. We did common pool resource experiments, prisoners' dilemma, and others with these fishermen. We wanted to test the effects of sanctions and foreign incentives. I'll talk a little bit about that. How do we do this? Why don't we just simulate a fishing experience? As in the real life, there's a conflict between individual and group gains. So there's a payment function. If a fisher maximizes its profits and overfishes, it reduces the income of the others. In this specific experiment, by every, it, what was it? Two units you over extract, you, all the other players lose one unit of, of a resource. Okay. So if a fisher maximizes, I said that, there's an economic optimum, of course, that's a no other fisher, and you play with real money, with real incentives. And, and this is pretty interesting to convince a funding agency for this. Okay? It's not that, that, this is sort of the hardest bit of it all. But you do it. What was the experimental design? 18 groups of five fishers who play for 20 grounds. Fishers are granted legal harvest from the turf with the possibility of over-extracting. In round 10, this is the first experiment we did, we had an external enforcement. So something like the Under Secretary of Fisheries, the Fishery Police, or however you call it in your countries, comes here and randomly samples if you're over-extracting. If you're over-extracting, you lose your harvest for that round, for that year. We give information on average extractions after every round. As I was saying, we really had to overcome a series of logistical issues. So it took us like a whole year just to get there. Okay? So you should see these computers don't look like this anymore. Now they've got these huge numbers this size. So it's just like a few numbers and a red button that you press. Okay? But this, this makes it, this was part of the whole strategy. Oh, I'm, I'm making the best of this, but to get data. So. What we did, fishers come from three main groupings. Well, this is replicated, etc. cetera. Um, Non-unionized fishermen, so fishermen who actually are free riders anyway. Fishermen from unions that are with a low performance, fishermen from unions that have a high performance, and as I said, in round 10, there's external enforcement. This is the over-harvest in the rounds. Here, this gap is where the enforcement comes. This is for the non-unionized fishermen. Okay? So if they comply with the quota, with the tack, the line would be here, just so you imagine. All right? The line is up here. So from round one of the game, the expectations of collaboration of the other people are practically null. They say, oh no, we're all going to steal. And of course, there, this sort of unravels, no cierto, and cooperation erodes as the game goes on. Round 10, external enforcement, so you can lose your money. And I, I insist that this is real money, and it's a lot of money. In this round, I actually had a problem in this phase. This is randomly people are selected to be enforced. This fisherman, who was uh, one of these free riders, got enforced like three times in a row. And then what happened was I had this engineer student who was sort of this size and looked 12, okay? And he was the one on the computer. So this guy just stood up and wanted to hit him, okay? Because he thought he was targeting him. So that's how real these games can actually become. After that, I lost my engineer, I must say. <laughs> but anyway, so we've got the external enforcement. There's a, a little bit of cooperation, and then again, of course, um, cooperation arose. This is how much money. This 9,000 pesos must be 15, 18 dollars, just so you imagine. That's how much each of these fishermen won. So there is money involved. 
These are the fishermen from low performance turfs. So expectations of collaboration are a little bit better, but cooperation erodes very fast. You get your external enforcement, boom, oh, yeah, start cooperating. But very slowly, cooperation erodes. And I assure you, if we would have played for 40 rounds, we would have probably ended up up here. What was a big surprise for me is what happened with the well high performance turfs. So cooperations of um, or sorry, expectations of collaboration, pretty high. Without external enforcement, cooperation starts eroding anyway. But with this external enforcement, boom, start collaborating, and this collaboration is maintained. I thought this was pretty good. So somehow, I've always talked about like the need for leaving communities alone and bottom-up processes and stuff. And this sort of says, yeah, but you still need a little bit of a strong hand on top of them. No? And, it's, and it's true. Okay, so these are actually able to internalize the norms. What was important for me and for data gathering is that this starts proving a little bit the external validity of these games. So the fishermen who do better in the field are doing better in the games. The fishermen who do worse in the field do worse in the games. So this sort of, at least in my mind, opens a new tool to play with. We can do experiments of anything. Professors of Harvard do it. Why can't we? So we started exploring interactions between access rights and cooperation to get a little bit more interesting, something that actually has to do more with the turf. So what we did here. Now we feel confident we've got our computers and stuff. So now we play with 10 fishermen. OK, so this experimental design involved 10 fishes. We play, again, 20 rounds, a common pool resource game. At round 10, this is a different game, but I won't get into detail. This is for another talk. But there's self-enforcement strategies. So it's not like a top-down enforcement. They're allowed to self-enforce. So some can see that others are stealing, and they can decide if they will tell on them or not. This is a lot more complex game, but I'm not going to get into that detail. It's just so you know the types of data we can actually get with this. Fishes from successful turfs only I'm going to show you today. But here what we decided to do is, OK, let's them, let them play a hake game and a local game. The local operates under a turf system. The hake under a, let's just call it, a de facto open access system. These are the rules of the game in Spanish. The rules are exactly the same. The only differences are what's in red. So here it says, you're going to fish loco, you're going to fish hake. You get 50 locos, you get 50 kilos of hake. That's the only difference okay, in, in the instructions of the game. These are only the people who have well, uh, sorry, good turfs, what I'm going to show you today anyway. OK, so remember, we're going to play a game. Only fishes with well-managed turfs for local and for hake. These are the results. The local, these are all new data. So the local, fortunately, follows the same pattern as the other one. Otherwise, I would have been in a lot of trouble. So quite a bit of cooperation. It erodes. Self-enforcement now, not external enforcement. So self-enforcement was also good enough to maintain cooperation in time. These are the same fishermen, or at least from the same uh, sort of groups of fishermen, for the hake. What are the, the expectations of collaboration for the hake? Very low. Well, it's an open access resource. Very low, self-enforcement, and continues low. Okay, so this, I think, is pretty interesting as well. So say, yeah, somehow, turfs are enabling some type of stewardship behavior. That is not here. And these are the same. Huh? So this also means. And it happens to us too, I guess. We can be really good stewards for some things and really bad for others. I'm really good for working with fishermen. I'm super, super bad at recycling. This is sort of the same things we're discovering here. Well, it, where it gets really interesting, and this is, they asked me to show non published data, so this is all non published. And this, this has a lot of ends, etc. This is just something we're exploring now, but I thought you might enjoy it. So we did this game adding uncertainty onto the resource stocks of the next round. OK, you're following me. This is important. So you actually don't know your tack. 
in the, in the next round. It can go up and down, I think it was 10 or 15%. So when you add uncertainty in the local game, this is what happens. More cooperation. Super cool. What happens if you add uncertainty in the Hake game? Oh. Well, so it gets really interesting. This. Haven't gone further. This is still low ends, so this might change, etc. But it sort of at least guides us a little bit to begin thinking about how turfs might actually help internalize pro social norms, begin understanding the role of uncertainty in natural resource management. And many times, remember, okay, this is really incredible. 1991, the government wanted to manage the local. And imagine, now we're talking about climate change adaptation stuff. Never thought about it before. But we need data that goes beyond abundance and capture per unit effort in order to understand these systems. User rights might actually generate important enabling social conditions for adaptation, I think. So that was my first part. This is a short, how much time do I have? Sorry? OK. So once we have this type of data, and this is just types of data, I've just given you a few examples. How can we start using this to start designing innovative improvements for TERFs? For now, I've just told you stuff about it. And it is interesting data. Once I got thinking about it, I sort of said, I actually have some data. So with this data, we discovered problems. We know that there's reduced price of key species. There's increased surveillance costs because of the theft. This is making turfs less profitable. We also start understanding enabling conditions, the ones I've been talking to you about. Cooperation, the role of social capital, the role of this territorial empowerment. There's also ecological enabling conditions, this latent biodiversity benefits that might be present in the turfs, etc. So the main thing is, how do we start using this to innovate with turfs to put them forward? And this is what I think is my main message of the, of the talk. It's, the problem with data is that once you know stuff, you have to do something about it. So what can we do? I call them learning platforms. Other people might call them pilots. I don't care. But what, for me, a learning platform is sort of a type of like collaborative, demonstration scale, experimental trail, where we can all like co-learn. So government co-learns in innovative management. The fishermen learn, we learn, we publish, we get new data, et cetera. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you two learning platforms that have emerged from these type of recognition of problems and recognition of enabling conditions. OK? The first learning platform is a program with artisanal fishers that can compensate them for the opportunity costs of setting aside a portion of their turf as a no-take zone. So something like that. Yeah, the outcome should be a scalable program that provides a, and this is the important bit, supplementary revenue to fishers in exchange for management actions that produced, and again, this is important, verified and enforced biodiversity benefits. Okay, so the idea is if you have a turf, you have a no-take zone, and somehow you can pay fishermen for this no-take zone. Okay. I am aware other people have talked about turf reserve systems. There's actually a bunch of money that Bloomberg put into these types of systems. Their model, though, sort of says, no, we don't need to pay fishermen. Just with the spillover effects of the no-take zone will be enough of an incentive. I don't know what type of fishermen they work with, well, but <laughs> that's not the type of fishermen I work with. Okay, so we really need to start understanding how to do this. I've actually, I have three of these systems today implemented as learning platforms. You can say, where did you get the money? Ah, philanthropy. So how did you convince them? I said, this is true. I said, you know what? You've been paying for an illusion of marine conservation all your life. An MPA. <laughs> What's that? Whoever measures something in an MPA. Here, what we guarantee is you pay us if we have verified and enforced biodiversity benefits. Like going to the supermarket. I go to the supermarket, I buy a can of beans. I don't buy the illusion of a future can of beans. <laughs> no, well, come on. Man. 
So, yeah, come on, this is serious stuff here. So, we've done this. We've actually had to develop enforcement technology. We're going to sign a contract. We have to enforce it. This is where I've met some of the weirdest people in my life. <laughs> that are, they're engineers based at San Francisco that develop these types of things. Strange people, but clever people. They teach cameras how to identify stuff. So they teach them when a boat is a boat. They teach them when a bird is a bird. So, so they, they can actually do stuff that we can't even imagine with these enforcement cameras. But this is not enough. So we've got three of these. But what we really need to know is how are we going to finance this? Other things that we already know, and I'm not going to go into detail, is what are the trajectories of biodiversity change? We can leave that for another class. And what I think is super important is how to design a system like this that is actually scalable. That is what we usually forget. We're really good at having good ideas. We suppose everybody's going to accept them. MPA is an example. But there's actually data that can help you design for scalability. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So what's the market model? Now, this is the financing model that I think of beyond spillover. We really need to assure demand for the, biodiver the biodiversity benefits of the program that maintains, or so, that the, oh, sorry, <laughs> that the program creates. They must secure these benefits. So we have small scale fishermen, probably need a broker. This is where things get super interesting. So you want to do research like this? I had to now create a foundation called Capital Azul, thanks to well, some pro bono work, I managed to do it. So now I have a foundation just to be able to do the research. Because I can't have the university paying the fisherman, can I? I can't receive external money. So it's, you start learning all these new things. But this is to be able to do research with data that can actually make a difference. Which is the outcome? Possible demand? Outcome-based philanthropy? Had a bit of money there. I don't see long-term money coming from there, but it might be a possibility. The other has to do with corporations holding risk from the coastal impact. So these are these typical biodiversity offset markets. So you could have regulatory-driven biodiversity offsets markets, voluntary-driven biodiversity offset markets. Another avenue could be actually selling seafood products with benefits because they're produced in, in a system that protects biodiversity. This is just me. Uh, I'm no marketing person, but I just call it for now for the papers. Bio plus seafood. Okay. So there is at least four possible revenues. Are these real or am I just like inventing stuff? They're pretty real. Huh? We've got new legal opportunities in Chile that allow and will start asking for biodiversity offsetting schemes. And this is another thing. All these regulations once industries to offset biodiversity in the ocean. How are we going to do that? I haven't been able to solve it. Friends in Cyro haven't solved it either. Here there might be a way. There's a new law on protected areas and biodiversity being discussed, which explicitly includes compensation. Did you know that everything we know about biodiversity offsets from a science standpoint, 80% comes from wetlands, in ecology. And today, three quarters of the countries of the world are making policies that will enable biodiversity offsetting in different types of ecosystems. That's super scary. We really need to generate our own capacities on how these systems are going to work. Here there's a chance. We know there's philanthropic interest, and there's oppor increased opportunities from the business sector. The CBD that we all love um, has a no net biodiversity loss program. Some uh, money from the bank now is coupled to no net loss programs. The industry has recognized advantages. The magnitude of the offset market has gone threefold in the next, it's expected to grow threefold in the next six years to $8 billion. And even in Chile, well, imagine Chile, our energy policy for 2035 says that any energy project will have to prove no net biodiversity loss. So there might be a demand for this. If there's a demand, the key issue is we need this system to scale. I do nothing with three of these areas. 45 hectares, what am I going to offset in 45 hectares? So how can we design a system to have a better probability of adoption? 
this is what I'm going to talk to you about now. And here, data could be really important. So every time you design something, there's a set of design choices that could influence scalability. Okay, so what we did here, we surveyed fishermen, we used a choice experiment, so we, we presented fishermen with different alternatives of a program. So each fisherman responded to sets of turf research program scenarios that had different enforcement strategies, contract lengths, payment strategies, different broker types, etc. They're in general they're small design decisions that we usually give for granted. We assess participant characteristics and we sort of model the probability of choosing one program over another. All of these program factors that we usually don't even think about had a significant impact on Fisher's intention to enroll. So what we did is we built something super simple, the most and the least desirable program from a fisherman's perspective. Okay. So this is the predicted probability of participation under different payment schemes. Yeah. So of course, if you pay them less, the probability of participation is less. If you pay more, the probability of participation is more. This here is for the undesirable characteristics. We, of course, didn't know they were undesirable before. What happened if we put together all the desirable characteristics? Look at that. So your predicted probability of participation, even in the lowest payment scenario, is already 50%. And this is just by looking, yeah, I have two more slides. And this is just by looking at um, predicted probabilities of participation. Just as an example, this is one of the program attributes. This is only for the desirable program. So this is a 10-year contract, probability of participation. That's a two-year renewable contract. So simple stuff can really make a difference, especially when you're first designing a program. These are, have to do with participant characteristics. And this is trust. So the blue line is like the mean trust of a fisherman. Okay. So you have very trustworthy fishermen who trust organizations a lot, who don't trust them too much. And you can see that the probability of participation from an undesirable program for negative trust fishermen is super low. But if you design the system well enough, you can actually get that participation. In fact, you can sort of, with the least payment, get the same amount of participation if you design the, the, the system well enough for non-trusters than you can get for trusters if you don't design the system well enough. These are all things we didn't know. Understanding these probabilities could actually help leverage existing turf models and design new turf models. This is my last theme now, and it's super fast. Other learning platforms. This thing can go on and on and on, and I can be here until 8 o'clock. OK, so I'm just going to do this one super fast. And this is, again, Fisherman with the first example, in this case now, of a bottom-up no-take MPA in Chile. So two turfs, Fisherman agreed to do a marine sanctuary. I love this picture. This is a, a municipal official, a fisherman, and a biologist. And they all come together from diving here. It took seven years to form this. But now, fishermen associated to this sanctuary, thanks to other projects, have a price premium for the algae they extract. Fishermen, this model is now currently informing the protected area and biodiversity law that we're writing in Chile. This law didn't want community-based participation. This learning platform proved it can be done. And this is where you have to be prepared for these windows of opportunity. This doesn't occur anywhere. It occurs in one of the four poorest councils in Chile. What was enabled here? These are the networks before the implementation of the, of the area. Just look at the lines. And this is after. So you have more communication, but you also have these little arrows you have reciprocity. We can work with reciprocity. We can build these types of things if we really want things to be successful. It's even scalable. This is the mayor of the place that built this MPA. And he invited his fellow mayors to talk about this. And they signed something. This is super rural places. Huh? The Declaration of Navidad. That's the place. And in this declaration, they said, we want to have something to say in marine conservation. So once you enable these things, stewardship can actually start occurring. And this is my last slide. So I got invited to talk about this. Do we need data to manage fisheries? I think we do. 
course we do. We did many types, bioeconomic, fishery, social, ecological, extensive, intensive, qualitative, quantitative, whatever you want. But I really don't think that's the interesting question. What really is important, I think, goes beyond what type of data. It's what you do with it. And I'll read this, because it took me time to write. What we really want is, <laughs> no, is to engage with the responsibility of transforming lessons from what data tells us into action, which requires on the ground engagement with diverse partners to initiate positive change. And believe me, eh, it really takes time, patience, and work. And also believe me, it won't get you into science or nature. Not at all. But you know what? It will make you happy. And I think that's the only way we can have some management coherence in small scale fisheries. Thank you. We have no ca causalidad. Uh, we can't, no. It's the same as with the game theory stuff. Are these fishermen intrinsically more prone to collaboration? Or was it the system and the success, let's say, of the system that make them more? Those, Because, again, we're not measuring these things. So I get to see them in year 25. If we would start measuring these things in year one, we could really start answering those types of questions. Fortunately, I don't know if fortunately, but lots of countries are actually wanting to establish rights-based type of management, and there's like this thing for it now. And maybe we can influence this in a way to start measuring some of these things from the onset. Uh, I'm actually doing this in Peru. So Peru wants a new turf system from the Novo, etc. They don't have one. And we're really, really doing a huge effort. There's a new Ministry of Fisheries in Peru to actually include some of these things for the learning of these processes. So yeah, this is the main issue of when we just measure some things and not others. Well, that's my frustration. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's different things there. So um, Juan Camilo Cárdenas, who's a Colombian, who I must say was one of the first ones who actually took these games to really rural places. They don't do it like us. They do it in other ways. But So he is a fan. Like His new thing now is using games for learning. That has a little bit uh, to, to do with, with, with what you're, you're talking about. So there is, of course, there's potential in that. Well, it depends a little bit on your objectives as well. But, but he does that quite a lot, and he's been writing about, about this quite extensively now. Yeah. No, but this, these are, this is um, everyone who plays participates in both fisheries in their real life. So, so yeah, these are small-scale, multi-species fisheries. I think you had a question. No, but we don't. O sea, come on. No, and if I implied that you can 
I didn't really talk about governance here. Huh? So if you want, I can. <laughs> so, no, but so if, if somehow what I said implies that you can sort of extract a turf system from one place to the other, I never meant to say that. This was about data, which I think is important to manage fisheries. Um, what I do think is important is like the, the Peru case is super cool. So Peru called me, sorry about the story, but I'm very bad at questions. So called me four years ago. Okay, and they said, Stefan, we are thinking in the future of doing this. And I said, you know what we have to do? Let's do this. We got a master's student, got a master's student. And I said, why don't you go along the coast and find all the informal self-government governance management systems along the coast? Let's do this. Three years later, master student has his master's. We have a paper. Anyway, he discovered 17 of these informal self-governance systems. 17. Last week, I was in Peru under as a vice minister. And I said, do you know you really have, he wants a turf system. Do you know you really have 17 of these things going on? And they're not only for Bentex, the Bentex and the MRSA. 17. And he, his eyes lit up because it's very dangerous to establish a new policy like this. I said, OK, this is what we're going to do. And then he had this huge forum and he said, what we're going to do is we're going to look into these 17 and see what legal support these would need to establish a system. So that's a totally different way of establishing a new turf system. But you need data. You need the type of data and institution. This is sort of what I mean, so I'm clarifying, huh? so, so you don't get this wrong. We need data on local institutions. We don't need to just copy a turf system from here to there. But Peru could now have a super nice turf system because it will be built from self-governance arrangements. But nobody was measuring them. Suddenly I was in a room with all these Peruvians and nobody knew of these 17 systems. That's what usually happens. Huh? In Chile, we lost at least four that I know of uh, self-governance systems because we imposed the turf policy on top of it. I've written about this extensively. It was a, let's learn from this for other systems, not copy this into other systems. Do, do, I don't know if I explained myself well enough, but I think this is a critical point for me anyway. Huh? I don't want people to come out here saying, oh, Stefan says that we can just copy a turf system from A to B, because well, I, would, I would die. 